I get all my slides on a website called Slides Carnival. So if you go online to Slides Carnival, they're all very pretty. Um, so I am going to chat tonight about the humanities and language arts part of the Fairhaven or high school program at Butler, which I am so jazzed about. I've basically been planning this in my mind for like a year, and now I finally had a chance to like write it all down. So here we go. Um, but first, you should know some things about me. That is my picture from Butler this year. I don't really like it, actually, but it was the only one I found. Um, but I have worked at Butler for 10 years now, if you can believe it. Um, I graduated from Dickinson College for my undergrad, and I have my master's in education from Loyola University of Maryland with a concentration in Montessori. Um, I have two Montessori diplomas now. I have the adolescent certification for teaching uh, 12 to 18 and the elementary for uh, 6 to 12 as well. And uh, my official title is the upper school director of education. I do lots of directory things all the time. Uh, but basically, I'm super passionate about this project, which all of you have spent time with me. So you should all know how passionate I am about this project at this point. OK, so we're going to dive in. This is my plan for the humanities. Tell me if you like it. I have a lot of Maria Montessori quotes because there is nothing better than a good Maria Montessori quote. Um, and what I realized actually doing this project is that she essentially outlines like what it is that you're supposed to do for teaching the humanities um, for Montessori adolescents. And the exact thing that I was thinking was also what she wrote. I was like, this is genius. Like she just knew. So she said, you have to teach the study of the history of mankind. So this should be treated as far as possible, as far as possible as a complete whole from which special periods can be chosen for individual study. AKA, you need to be looking at history, not as just like, let me tell you everything that happened in history, but focusing on specific periods that activate engagement and interest, right? And from there, seeing the whole picture of what history is really all about and humanities. So when you look at the, at the curriculum, um, the humanities program is a three-year cycle. This should map entirely to the science as well, which is also running on a three-year cycle. Um, so you have cycle A, cycle B, and cycle C. The beauty of this is that it's a three-year program. So you don't have to come in in cycle A, right? You can come in in cycle B and then you'll get B, C, A. Like they, ju they just keep going all the time and you can do them in any order. It doesn't matter. I just called them A, B, and C because I had to call them something. Um, so the way I thought about this a lot and defined it is I was like, okay, if you're going to look at history from three different angles or lenses, one would be places, looking at um, specific places geographically and looking at history through the lens of place, looking at people, specifically historical figures that are um, of interest or did something to impact the world or history in some way. And finally, ideas. What are some of the ideas that have really changed the world and um, have been sort of threaded throughout history in the way that they have um, they have changed lives? So I'm gonna dive into more of this, I promise, but it is like truly interesting. Um, but it's worth noting that the um, students are going to explore content chronologically, which makes sense, right? You have to know what happened at the beginning in order to see where you are towards the end, um, using a variety of different formats, including lectures, timelines, maps, readings, essays, projects, presentations, document-based questions, and so on. You guys know I'm a big fan of a document-based question. <laughs> um, and it's also worth noting, lectures are important as well. I was just with my cousin who is in college um, studying in Scotland, and I was kind of peppering her with questions about this, where I was like, tell me about your high school and college experience. And she was like, they do actually need to know how to sit through a lecture. Like college is a lot of that. But at the same time, they have to know how to be able to like take readings and analyze them and, and create them themselves. So we're going to be doing all of that as preparation for college work. And if you've been with me in the intermediate, you know, I always draw this umbrella when we talk about the humanities, right? And what falls under the umbrella of humanities? Well, that would be history, literature, philosophy, art history specifically, which is a great love of mine, religion, government, psychology, and so much more. So 
like what we do in the intermediate, all these different strands of humanities are going to be woven together to fully understand place, people, and ideas. So that's sort of the, the curriculum in a nutshell. I have another Maria Montessori quote. I have many. Um, she says, another aspect of history is that which deals with the effect on humanity of the geographical environment of contact between different peoples. The wars and conquests of empire should be studied in relation to their ideals and moral standards and the influence of religion and patriotism on human behavior should be observed. So as I was reading this, I was like, oh, she's literally talking about place and, con and contact between people in places, which led me to create something all about place. So in cycle A, when we're going to look at places, we're going to do a year-long studies of different cities and regions across the world. These examples, I want you to know, I asked the intermediates today. I was like, what places do you want to explore? I, I went to them directly. And this is what they said. They said, we would want to know more about Iceland, about various places in Western Europe, Australia, Japan, South Africa, the Middle East, Canada, Mexico, Colombia, India, Hong Kong, and just so much more. So given that we can't actually study every single place that exists on the planet in one year or even in a lifetime, there's just no way to do it. You know, when we get together at the beginning of the year, um, students have the opportunity to collectively decide, right? Like what are the cities and regions that we want to study, okay? Um, because I think that's important. One, we have to come to some sort of consensus because we are a group, but at the same time, you tell me what you're interested in learning about, and we'll, we'll make sure that we're doing a study of those places that contain the most interest and to make sure that we're covering a diverse array of places, right? We can't just study Europe. That's incredibly Eurocentric, right? We need to also be looking at places in South America, in Africa, in Asia, um, to, to really understand how all these different places are connected to one another, because that's what history is, right? It's looking at places and people and ideas and seeing how, how have those evolved over time and how do they relate to others? It's like a, it's like a giant tapestry, I think, that's woven together. So in the third trimester, um, Students have the opportunity to specialize a little bit further in preparation for either an AP exam, if you're going to take an AP exam, um, or do a final project of some kind. Either way, you're doing something, but the choice is yours. So if you decide you want to go for the AP exam because you're looking for the college credit, um, we've basically been prepping all year towards taking either human geography, if you sort of specialize more in that direction, or in world history. And um, their world history exam is modern, specifically modern world history. Um, when I was in school, world history was literally the entirety of world history in one exam. And it was so hard. So clearly the college board has figured out that they should not do that anymore. And now they specifically make it more, um, more modern world history. Or if that's not your jam, you're like, no, I, I don't really want to prep for an AP exam. That's That seems hard. Um, you're still going to do a final project of some kind, but you have a lot more flexibility, right? Or, you know, you can do a, like a really intense essay examination of a particular region, like one that you just loved that we were studying. Um, you could do a cross-cultural examination of different regions where you're like, oh, I didn't realize that um, this region and that region were so similar or so different in a lot of ways. And I really want to look at those two in concert with one another. Or, you know, we study a particular place and you decide to contact the embassy in DC and say, I'm going to, I'm going to do an interview with some of the diplomats down there. And I'm going to look at um, the way this particular region is, is a player on the international stage, right? Or whatever you can come up with, right? These were just some ideas that came to me. Uh, but either way, it's going to be devoting yourself to some kind of bigger final project because everything deserves, you know, sort of that final capstone piece to it that we've been working towards all year. So that's place in a nutshell. And you'll see the cycles are really similar to one another. Oh, sorry, I have, I have another Maria Montessori quote. So this is what she wrote. She said, a detailed study should be made of one period, event, or life of some personage who has aroused special interest. This would involve the consultation and comparison of documents, chronicles, and portraits until a real understanding of the subject has been achieved, aka people. So this is where I got my idea about people. 
as I, is she specifically saying, right? You have to look at specific lives of individual people and how they contributed to our understanding of humanities. So this is what I have for people. Um, it's gonna be another year long study. We're gonna look at historical figures that made an impact on the world in some way. And once again, I asked the intermediates, who are some of the people that you would be interested in studying? And they said, um, Jane Goodall, for sure. I put in the founding fathers because I was like, you can't really understand how the United States came to be as it is if you don't study them. Um, they said Julius Caesar, revolutionaries, anybody who led a revolution of some kind was of interest. Jane Austen, um, Marsha P. Johnson, Napoleon, I put in Wangari Matai because I think she's fabulous and just so much more, right? And once again, you have to kind of get together and collectively decide, okay, which are the people that we really, really, really want to study and we'll cover a diverse range of backgrounds, right? We we need to look at, at geographic location. We need to look at time period. We need to look at, at race and gender, right? And make sure we're really seeing a broad array of people. And so from the person, you use that essentially as the launch pad to figure out what is the history around that person, that time period, that place, right? And looking at all these different figures and how they are connected to one another. So if we were going to do Maria Montessori, for example, which honestly, I'm surprised she didn't make this list. Um, you know, she met Gandhi at one point and Gandhi said to her, you need to go to India to bring Montessori there, right? Look at how those two people who are visionaries in their own right are connected to one another. Now we've started to kind of make connections between different visionaries and you sort of see how ideas spread that way and the ways in which um, history has evolved. So once again, in the third trimester, um, you're either, you know, shooting for an AP exam or you're doing a final project. Um, this year in cycle B, if you want to do an AP exam, we're prepping more towards U.S. history or European history, depending on your interest. Um, the college board is fairly Eurocentric and American centric, so they don't have any other ones other than those two that are kind of in this vein, but um, you know, you're, you're welcome to go for the college credit if you want. Um, but if you don't want to, um, you also could do a biographical examination of a particular person who was really of interest to you. Um, you could look at multiple historical figures um, and how they have connected to one another. Um, or you can actually go out and talk to people who are change makers in their own right. Um, and and connect with them to see what it would be like to be living living history right now or relatives of somebody who um, has died but was uh, a change maker in some way or whatever else you can come up with. Okay, and then she said this, the, the classic Maria Montessori. A special study should be made of the present day and the nation, including the constitution, the laws, their special merits and moral characteristics. This study should be plentifully illustrated by references to current literature and visits to places that have historical importance. Well, lucky us, we live right near Washington, DC. So there's so many ways to do this. Um, but I took this again to mean, she's talking about ideas, right? She's talking specifically about ideas that have like created a nation, but it doesn't just have to be our nation. It can be ideas that have shaped the world in any particular way. And so thus I got to ideas, which would be cycle C. Um, so I was the one that came up with most of this list because I got so excited about it, but I did run it by the intermediates and they were like, oh, you should add this. Um, so I was thinking like, what are some ideas that have literally shaped the world? Well, farming for one, right? We are not hunter gatherers anymore. Writing and printing have changed the world in really significant ways. Um, religion, hugely, um, just the concept of evolution and understanding that. Um, industrialization, then moving from farming into more industrialized economies, which led me to free market economics is the way that the world works and has changed it. Medicine, the way we approach that. Um, politics, all different kinds of politics. Um, gender roles and the way those have changed over time. And then I started to think more modern day and I was like, well, think about the way that computers and the internet, and now we're getting into a place where artificial intelligence is sort of this big pressing idea of our of our time. And so much more, right? I mean, you you could do so many, but once again, we have to kind of get together and collectively decide, okay, which are the ideas that we're really interested in pursuing because we can't do all of them. Although there's a lot of crossover between them, right? 
And then like with places and with people, you use the idea as, as a launch pad, right? Or a jumping off point to see who are the major players in this idea? What are the different regions that have been affected by this? And um, and how has this idea changed over time and all the different places and people that it has impacted? So you can see, right? It's like places, people, and ideas, they're, uh, they're intimately connected to one another. You can't study one without the other two, right? But it's just which lens we're applying to our study of history that makes it a little bit different, right? And interesting. Um, and those who have studied poetry with me know that I'm, this is kind of my jam, right? Like we do poetry all three years, but one year we study forms, one year we study themes, and the other year we study poets, right? We're constantly cycling back to the same things. It's just a different way of looking at it every time. And then of course you get to the third trimester, you know, um, for AP exams this year, uh, you could do comparative government and politics if you want, uh, which is a newer exam, it's kind of interesting. Um, US government and politics is, is a classic. Um, and then also, and if you were really interested in microeconomics, which I personally love, um, you could specialize more in the, the microecon. They do have macro as well. Uh, if you really wanna do macroeconomics, we could talk about it. It's not my specialty. Um, I'm much more well-versed in microeconomics, but you know, sky's the limit. If you decide you wanna do it, just let me know. Um, and then of course, if that, again, you're like, no, no, thank you, I'm good. Um, you can do an in-depth examination of a particular idea that has really resonated with you. You can look at multiple ideas um, or you can actually go out and talk to people who are experts in a particular idea, right? Um, or a particular invention of some kind. Um, we're so blessed to live where we live, right? We have, we have museums, we have archives, we have experts, right? We have universities that of people who can help us um, to under, really understand more a particular idea. There's almost definitely a Maria Montessori quote after this one. Yep. And uh, this is the best one, definitely, um, because she kind of comes to this conclusion about the humanities. And she's like, okay, you need to study this, study this, study this. And when you do that, these studies should consider that uplifting of the inner life of humanity towards tendencies that grow ever less in cruelty and violence and strive to form ever wider groups of associated individuals. And if you know anything about Maria Montessori, she was an advocate for peace and education for peace. And she basically thought that when you study history in this particular way, you create a person, right, who understands human beings better and the way that human beings associate with one another and becomes a person who drives the present day, which will then eventually become history. So if you want to have a more peaceful future, right, you have to be working on it now so that eventually that future becomes past, um, which is, you know, just so cool, I think. This that's why we do this. Um, okay, I want to, oh no, wait, there's more. I lied. Okay, <laughs> additional explorations here. So, okay, that's all the stuff that we're going to do in school. Yay. But if you are really jazzed about the humanities and you're like, yeah, I want to do more. Um, Montessori Model UN, uh, some of you have been to MMUN for many years and now have been as bureau members. Um, but basically you have, you continue to have the opportunity to serve as a bureau member. Um, it's a leadership opportunity. You guide younger students um, in their exploration of Montessori Model UN and expand your own global thinking and impact. I think every time you go back to MMUN, you get a little more out of it every time because you really start to see the work that's happening there is mimicking the work that the UN is doing. So you could find essentially that that work leads you towards wanting to really be involved in global development in some way. Um, I am very excited about this. I've wanted to do National History Day for years because middle school students can do this, but I just can't find when in the school year to do it because we're so busy in the intermediate. We do so many things. So I was like, great, high school is going to do this now. So if you're interested, um, you can participate in National History Day where you basically do a project. Um, it can be uh, there, they have these five different categories. You can make a documentary, an exhibit, a performance, a paper, or a website. And it has to be based on whatever theme it is that they decide. So 2024's theme is turning points in history. 
Um, but they choose a new theme every year. And then there's, you know, it, it's, it's a research process. You have to pick your topic within the theme. You have to decide what medium you're going to do. And then you do all the research. And then it sort of goes through levels of like, there's, um, there's like a local level. And then if you make it from there, it goes to the state and then eventually to national. Um, I care less about the competition, obviously, because I'm a Montessorian and we're not into that. But I do think it's a really valuable experience. And it gives you an opportunity to see what other high school students are doing on this particular topic. It's a, it's a learning and a growth opportunity, I think, for those that want to do it. Okay. Part of a Montessori high school program is actually getting off campus to do work in other places. And we're so blessed because when I started to put this together, I was like, oh, think of all the places that we can go that relate to the humanities where we actually can do on-site field work there. Um, so one in particular is Button Farm Living History Center. It is seven minutes down the road from Butler. It's so close. Um, but basically Button Farm is a, it's a historic farmstead and they do some fabulous programming around their farm, around the historic home and around the history there. So going there to basically say, how can we help what's happening at Button Farm and what can we, can we get out of it um, in our studies? How does it connect to what we're doing? Um, Montgomery history in general is fabulous. Um, you can have access to um to research and records through their archive system. And we've worked with some of the research librarians before there and they're awesome. So, you know, depending on what we're, what we're studying, going there to get some actual primary source documentation and then come back is going to be super valuable. Um, I want to say having access to any research librarian is just fabulous. But wait, there's more. So Montgomery County Agricultural History Farm Park, uh, we've actually worked with them in the past too. Um, they're fantastic. It's, it's again, one of these like uh, a farmstead that was turned into a park that's dedicated to preserving the agricultural history of Montgomery County. And there's a lot of it. Um, so working specifically with the parks, um, the park rangers to uh, maintain their natural resources like trails, exhibits, tours, and other programs that they do is a really tremendous opportunity for us. Seneca Schoolhouse, some of you have been to Seneca Schoolhouse when you were little, uh, but basically we, they are also so close to us, right? So we have an opportunity to work with um, some of the um, people who do the, the programming there, um, where you experience what a typical day in an 1880 one room schoolhouse would have looked like. Um, they're always looking for, for volunteers and people to support what they do. And again, for us to have that, um, that on-site experience to bring back to our studies is super valuable. And there's more. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to stop after this. I was like, there's just too many. Um, we have been over to the Sandy Spring Museum and Archives. They're super fabulous. It's not that close to us, but it's not that far away either. Um, they love us over at that museum and archives. Why? Because Montessori kids can read cursive and no one else can anymore. So um, working with the curators of the, of the exhibits. They have permanent exhibits that stay there and also some uh, traveling art exhibits that are really fabulous. So if anybody ever wanted to work in a museum, this is a great place to kind of get your hands, um, get, your, get your feet wet um, because it's small. But also what they really need are people to come and help transcribe documents um, to preserve the local history, right? Um, this is something that other Montessori schools are doing, and I want us to be doing it too in our local area because it is so important and valuable. Um, and then we just have tons of historic buildings there. Um, the Bell Dawson House is closed for renovations right now, but I've been bringing students there for years. Um, it's a fantastic historic home and tour experience. Um, and then right next to it is the Stone Street Museum of 19th Century Medicine, which is tiny and deeply fascinating. They have all the old like instruments that they would have used. They actually picked up that building and moved it to its current location. Um, and it looks like a tiny house. Um, and um, also we're, we're very close to Poolsville, right? We're just, you know, 15 minutes down the road. So the John Poole House and the Old Town Bank uh, Museum and Exhibit Hall are both places where we can really get our, our feet wet with history and um, working with the experts who do the work there just enriches everything that we're already doing. 
Okay, I think that brings me to the end of humanities. So I'm gonna pause there just to say, do you guys have any questions about humanities? Does that make sense? Do you have anything to add? I have a question. Please, Cynthia. So what will the assignments look like? Will there be like, like will they always be like writing assignments or? <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be a mix of a lot of things, I think. Um, some of it is going to be writing based. Some of it is going to be more um, like creative, I would say, like, you know, doing doing art to showcase something or um, you doing some sort of like presentation type thing. Um, we're definitely going to be practicing public speaking as always. Um, but a lot of it is, and this is sort of a hallmark of Montessori as well, where it's like, we're studying a particular topic and then whatever follow-up work that you want to do with that can take the form of whatever you want it to be, right? So I'll give you a perfect example right now. So we're studying peace um, in the, the unit that I'm currently teaching with the intermediates. And I told them, I, I gave them a whole lesson on different layers of peace, right? And then I said, okay, you're going to choose a layer of peace. You're going to choose some sort of medium to represent this layer of peace. And then you're going to put together something that you're going to showcase to um, the parents when we come back from our trip. So, so we brainstormed together. We were like, you could write an essay, you could do an art piece, you could do a musical composition, you could do a video, you could do, um, God, there were so many different ideas. Like you sort of, you name it, right? And everybody has the freedom to choose the thing that resonates with them the most. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, it's really awesome actually. And you know, if you're the type of person that you're like, I, I really wanna get the AP credit, like that kind of thing, then yes, we're gonna do some practice tests as well because I would never send you in there blind going, I've never done a practice test before. That's not, <laughs> that's not setting you up for success. Um, but I really firmly believe that history is best learned when you're really interested in what you're doing and you have the opportunity to engage with it in your own way. Like nothing makes history more boring than just memorizing like names and dates and places over and over and over again. And that is not my intention. So, um, that's, that's sort of the methodology behind it. Any other questions about humanities before I move on? Okay. If they come to you, it's totally fine. Let me talk to you about language arts. This, this is what I do, honestly. So, okay. Oh, we have a Maria Montessori quote, shocker. Um, but this is what she said about language. Because again, I went back to the source. I was like, this has to be authentic. That's why we're here. So she says, the development of language is part of the development of the personality, for words are the natural means of expressing thoughts and establishing understanding between men people in this case, right? But if you think about it, that is literally why language is so important, right? Is because it helps us to define who we are and to express the things that are in our head and communicate with other people, right? Like when you really get down to the essence of why we do it, right? It is a means of self-expression and communication. So I use that as my jumping off point to really think about the curriculum. A lot of this is building on what you guys have done in the intermediate. It's going to be seamless transition, but we're going to add some stuff, right? Because you're much more capable now than you were when you were seventh years. So what are we going to do? The, the language arts program includes, we're going to be reading lots of diverse literature, right? And I do mean diverse in all senses of the word, right? You know, different authors diff from different places about different topics, you know, from different time periods. Um, we're going to try to be reading as widely as possible. You're going to continue to hone your literary analysis skills. I know you might be like, but why, Miss Radwin? Why? Because trust me, it's really important. One for just, you know, college and university life. But even if you get beyond that, it's kind of like when you learn math, it's like literary analysis skills train your brain to think in a particular way. So anytime you read anything, you're able to look at it critically and ask yourself, what does the author really mean by this? How do I connect with this statement? How do I interpret it? Um, so we're going to continue to work on that. 
you guys have gotten so good. I, I'm not worried about it. Um, we are going to practice lots of different styles of writing, um, expository writing, persuasive writing, analytical writing, research-based writing, and so much more, because you have to do all of it. It just, you never know what's going to come up in your life when you're going to need to do this. We're going to continue to cement a really good understanding of grammar and vocabulary. And all of this, you know, if you've been at Butler from your elementary years, you have been building towards this for years and years and years, right? We're just going to continue that. Um, but in order to really be an intelligent person who lives in the world, you need to have a good understanding of grammar and vocabulary. It just is necessary to life. And we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we were not helping you get there. Bonus, of course, it really helps you on the SAT. When you're trying to get into college. <laughs> Um, we're going to continue to focus on public speaking skills. This actually, more than anything else, is one of the things you'll use the most in your life, right? Anytime you need to get up in front of other people and give a presentation or do anything of any kind, these skills are going to have your back, right? It, I cannot even explain in adult life how valuable this is. Um, we're going to emphasize creative Expression, of course, because we love to write creatively as well as analytically and effective communication. So not only can I take what is creatively inside my brain and get it out, but when it comes out, does it make sense? Can someone understand what I am trying to communicate to them? Um, everything I do is interdisciplinary, but especially with language arts, you know, there should be language arts woven into the sciences, into the humanities, into world language, like what Senora is doing in Spanish, and into the fine arts, right? Music, drama, um, dance, all sorts of visual arts, right? There, There's language in everything that we do. So that's sort of the, again, the overview, the curriculum in a nutshell. So, Here's kind of how it's broken down. We're still gonna have literature circle because the lit circle is great. Um, so we're gonna continue to read and discuss diverse literature in small groups um, because it's liter that's what an English class is, honestly, is reading things and then talking about it. Um, these, I, I, um, I got some input from the intermediates, but um, when I really stopped to think about like, what would we read? Right. I was like, OK, well, you can read thematically. Right. And you can look specifically at a particular theme in literature. So you can read books written during and about the Harlem Renaissance. You can look at um, uh, books as a form of protest. Right. You can look at queer literature. You can I've, I've been doing a ton of utopia and dystopia this year. Right. You can do gothic literature. Uh, you can you can kind of pick a particular theme in literature and just say, go for it, right? Like we're going to read books around this theme. The other thing you can do is you can do a specific author study. And I've actually done this and it's super fun when you read everything that that person has written, or if you can't get to everything, like the, the big headliners. So we can do more Shakespeare for those that are interested, right? Focusing on things that we haven't read um, and looking at some of the connections between the, the plays and the sonnets and the things that he wrote. Um, we can look, Austin is an easy one to do because she only wrote, I think, like seven novels or something like that. And then a lot of other writing. So you can read seven novels um, or not. Like If you're like, oh, no, I don't want to do seven novels. Maybe I'll do three. That's fine. Right. Um, Ishiguro is one of my favorite authors of all time. Um, he has written tremendous books like uh, Never Let Me Go, The Remains of the Day, um, When We Were Orphans, and so much more. So sometimes it's fun to do a specific author study because you can really compare and contrast like what were they doing in this book versus this book versus that book, right? And how has their craft changed over time, right? Like you look at some of their earliest writings, their middle writings, and some at the end, you're like, oh, wow, they have really moved in a particular direction. Um, I didn't put Jhumpa Lahiri on here, but I should have because she is one of those authors that I really, I've taught her stuff before to intermediates and like I, I'm seeing her evolution as a writer right now in ways that are really interesting. So she is one that I definitely would want to do as well. Um, okay, you can study, you can do literature in form, right? Like we can say, we're going to do all short stories. Great. And we'll just get a bunch of short stories. We're going to focus on poetry specifically. Great. We'll read tons of poetry. Um, maybe you're a great graphic novel lover, right? And you're like, yes, I just want to read tons of graphic novels. Great. We can do that. 
right? And then you're really looking at different forms and saying, well, how did they do this? And how did the author do that? And, you know, what are different ways to be creative within the form that you're working in? You could do a genre study, right? You can say like, I want to do science fiction. And then you get like the best of the best in science fiction or fantasy or mystery, right? Um, like, you know, I am a fantasy person, right? So it's like you would, we would read Tolkien for sure. We would, you know, look at the influence of Harry Potter on the genre. Like there are some sort of staple things that you um, should definitely read if you're going to do a genre study. And then this one is for Frog in particular. Frog has been after me for years to do um, film analysis, right? And film theory. So I was like, yes, we will do that. Um, you can look at visual media as text. So how do you analyze a movie or a TV show? Or honestly, just like a piece of art of some kind, right? The technique that you use is similar to literary analysis, but instead of using words to extrapolate meaning, you're using images instead. And sometimes, you know, music as well, and all the different pieces that we put together to create an effect of some kind. That's what that's what art is, right? And what text is. All of those are awesome. We're gonna have to come to some sort of consensus about what we wanna do, but it can be, it will either be something thematic, authorial, form genre, or looking outside the box of, of what is text. Um, okay, these are our primary source texts, right? Like we're gonna read lots of things and or watch lots of movies. Um, but the other thing I'm going to start to introduce you to is critical approaches to analyzing literature. So this is kind of like putting your toe in what the next thing is going to be after you're done with high school, which is not only what is this text, but how do I analyze this text in a specific lens or frame of mind, right? So I can look at this text as itself, right? Just itself. That's what we call formalism. Or I can look at it through the lens of history, what was happening during this time period, the time period that it was written and or the time period that it's trying to portray, right? I can look at this particular text through the lens of post-colonialism, right? So what was happening in this particular place around imperialism and colonialism, right? So much literature. And when you look at it through a post-colonial lens, you're like, oh, wow, this is actually super dramatic in a way I didn't realize. The same thing is true with feminism and gender studies, right? How do I look at this text through a lens of, um, of feminism and gender and queer studies? Um, and finally, this is a, it's a newer thing. Uh, well, I guess maybe in the past like 20 years or so. Um, but eco-criticism is something that's really come up a lot more um, where it's how do we look at text through a, the lens of nature? right? How is nature being treated in this text? How does this relate to our understanding of the climate crisis? It's so present and so interesting, honestly. Um, and then if you want to take the um, AP Lit exam, AP Literature and Composition, you can do that. You can choose whichever year you feel most prepared to take it, right? So we're always going to be doing Literature Circle, but you might want to wait until you are a junior or a senior um, to take it because you're like, I want a little bit more of a skill set un under my belt before I'm ready to tackle this. That's fine. Or not at all. Pro I Trust me, you're going to be writing a ton, reading a ton. You don't need to unless you want to. Um, language. So... You will continue to expand your vocabulary knowledge with vocabulary from classical roots. Um, if you, I technically speaking, you should have done book A when you were a seventh year, book B when you were an eighth year, and book C when you were a ninth year. And then you would do book D when you were a 10th year and E when you were an 11th year. Some people in this class decide that they want to like speed run through these books. So they're moving a little bit quicker. That's fine. I don't care. You can move at whatever pace you want. Um, some people have not even tried any of these books and are going to be starting at book A. That is also completely fine. You, you do have to do them in order because they build on each other, but it doesn't matter where you start, right? Like I just happen to start them when you're a seventh year in the intermediate. Like you could literally start anytime. But I stand by it that doing Latin roots really, really, really improves your vocabulary because it helps you to understand where the word comes from and you use the roots to unlock any word that you don't know 
It's direct preparation for what you're going to see on the SAT, 100%. And it makes you smarter. So all I'm, all I'm saying here is you would be well advised to continue to work through these. Um, but what is a little bit different from the intermediate is that we're not going to have a specific class dedicated to it. Um, it's just going to be you're going to be working through the book and checking in with me periodically to, to um, look at your progress. Um, I am investigating a new grammar series, which I'm very jazzed about, called Grammar for the Well-Trained Mind, um, that again, basically just sort of cements the understanding of grammar. I know you guys know this stuff, but it would help if, um, like, we, we really went back to it and made sure, like, I really understand how grammar works, and I really understand punctuation and syntax and things like that. Um, and this is just a fun sort of interesting way to do it. Um, and then the other series that I am working with right now is um, called The Lost Tools of Writing, which is fantastic. I'm going to pilot it um, this coming year. Um, but basically, it looks at different styles of writing through uh, a classical framework, um, which they call invention, arrangement, and elocution. So you basically come up with something, you arrange it in a particular way, and then you you speak it, right? Or you perform it in some way. So the way this curriculum goes is it starts just with like a very basic persuasive essay, right? Like you're just trying to tell me why dogs are better than cats. And then it moves a little further into how I can compare something. It moves even further into um, judicial address and finally ends with deliberative rhetoric. So it really starts to get into the nitty gritty of how you construct arguments in a way that um, is, uh, is logical and makes sense and persuades people, um, which leads directly into practicing rhetorical analysis, identifying claims in an argument, supporting those claims with evidence. It's like the really basic fundamentals of like, how do I convince someone of something, right? Like, I want extra recess. Great, well, give me all of your arguments. Rhetorical analysis basically teaches you how to make the best case for something. Um, and this is a direct preparation for that AP language and composition exam for those that wanna take it. It's all about rhetorical analysis, basically, and rhetorical devices. And creative expression, because it wouldn't be us if we didn't have some creative expression. So. You should be expressing yourself creatively always, right? Um, in a variety of different ways, right? Maybe you are a person who likes to do short, short fiction, short stories. Great. Maybe longer form fiction. You're like, I'm going to write a novel during NaNoWriMo for real this year, guys. Great. You can write a novel. Um, maybe you're a poetry person. That's lovely. Maybe it's more in the dramatic arts, right? I had a student once um, write his own musical based on a creative writing prompt that we had done in Writer's Workshop. So cool, right? Um, or multi-genre, right? Like you can combine some of those genres and put them together so you're expressing yourself creatively. I am gonna be running creative writing seminars um, for those that are interested in doing them. Uh, really, really, we're gonna be emphasizing the writing process, getting all the way from brainstorming um, to drafting, revising, and editing. Um, giving How to give constructive feedback, right? When you give somebody something to read, what is it that they can tell you that will be most helpful to you? And also how can they deliver that to you in a way that is conscious of the work that you're putting in, right? That is a huge part of creative, of any kind of writing um, is how, how do I receive feedback on this? And what's most important about this is that it develops your own voice as a writer, right? How, how do I take what is, what is in my brain and, and put it out on the paper in a way that is uniquely me? right? No one is trying to come in and tell you to be anything that you're not. They're just trying to come in and, and tell you, I don't really understand this. Can you explain it to me a little bit better, right? That's the beauty of the creative writing seminar. So if you're going to do that, um, you know, you're going to end up developing a whole portfolio of writing over the course of three years. Um, if you are a person who wants to send that to a literary contest, that's awesome. Or to a literary magazine or journal, that's great. Um, if you really love creative writing, though, a lot of colleges will ask you for a portfolio of the writing that you've done in order to actually like get entry into the program. So this is creating that body of work for you. So you don't have to get to college and be like, oh, my gosh, I have to write 25 things in like two days. No, 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 no. You have like a whole body of work that travels with you um, so that you you can gain entry into that if that is your goal. Do I have a Maria Montessori quote here? Yes, I do. 
This is the last one, I think. Um, so she talks about opportunities for self-expression. She says, for this purpose, there would be all kinds of artistic occupations open to free choice, both as to the time and nature of the work. Some must be for the individual, some, and some would require the cooperation of a group. They would involve artistic and linguistic ability and imagination. So she basically is like, you can't run a Montessori program without opportunities for self-expression. And, and language is one of those ways in which we do that. It's not the only way, right? Um, but it's one of the most important ways. And I just thought it was great that she noticed, like, some of it you do by yourself and some of it you do with a group. And the experiences of those two things are really different. Um, but we're going to do both of those things, as always. But we're going to hone your artistic and linguistic ability and imagination. Additionally, right, that's all the stuff we're going to do in school. But if you're if you're interested beyond that, because, you know, language arts is your jam, um, the Columbia Scholastic Press Association is a fantastic organization. I actually was part of it when I was in school. It's been around a long time. Um, but basically, it's through Columbia University in New York. And if you um, decide to do some sort of journalistic endeavor, right, like you're on a, a newspaper, a yearbook, a literary magazine, you do photography or some kind of like, you know, a radio or video broadcast, you can be invited to go to their fall conference or their spring convention. And they have all sorts of workshops that are dedicated to journalism and preserving the integrity of journalism. Um, I was really into my school's literary magazine, which is why I was invited to go. And I loved it. I, it was a, just a phenomenal experience. So I would love for us to do some of that stuff here and have the opportunity then to go. Um, but it's up to you guys, right? If you, if you want to do it, let's do it. If you don't want to do it, that's okay. You don't have to. Um, but the opportunity is there if you want it. Um, and then also I am dying to get us into debate. I just, all the four corner debates that we do just tell me that there's nothing adolescents love more than arguing about something. So um, if you, the National Speed, Speech and Debate Association is sort of like the go-to organization for this. Um, we have the opportunity to learn how to actually do debate because it is a skill that has to be learned and practiced. Um, the NSDA has something called the Springboard Series, which is totally free, um, and it helps students uh, orient themselves to national speech and debate competitions in a really low impact way, right? So it's not very stressful, um, but you and it's and it's all virtual, and so you get the opportunity to kind of get out there and try without making a giant commitment to something before you really know what it is. Um, and I would love for us to to try it, right, and see if we like it. And if we do, we can have our own debate team and start going to competitions. And if we don't, that is also okay. Okay, I have come to the end. That was a lot. And it's 648. So does anybody have any questions about language arts in particular or anything that I have been over? or comments, or feedback. I mean, <laughs> you know me, I'm open to everything. You could just tell me like, I like that or I don't. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited for Emma. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad. I, mm -hmm. I really put it together having, having the students in mind. It also made me excited about some of the things that I did when I was doing my A-levels in England, in particular around literature pieces, the, the um, studying of, an, of a novelist and looking at like Jane Austen's Juvenilia all the way through. Yeah. 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 It's making me excited for these students. I have a question. Sure. Do, am I, could I take both of the classes next year? the humanities and language arts, or is it just like one class? Oh no, you're gonna do both of them, trust me. This, Sophia, this is basically translating to like whatever history class you're taking and whatever English class you're taking. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, so you're definitely gonna do, so, we, you know, we're calling it humanities, but it's, but it's essentially, right, like history. Um, and then you'll do something in language arts, which is, um, which is English. The places where you get a little bit of choice though, like 
like you definitely have to do we're you're, we're all going to do the humanities thing whatever it is and you definitely have to do literature circle and some of the language stuff the creative writing piece if that's not if you're not so interested in it um that's more like an elective basically so you don't have to take that um but if you are interested i i am offering it does that make sense yep okay um Yes. No, the reason why they're both on this session is because I am teaching both of them. So I was like, oh, we'll just talk about both subjects at the same time. Why not? Other questions? Um, I, I love the idea of the speech and debate club. I was wondering, like, how many kids would you need to, like, get on board to make that a team? You know, I'm not sure. Actually, I've done some preliminary research into into the organization and like the springboard series and that kind of thing. Um, but I'm not sure how many you need to make it like an official team or anything. Um, it can't I can't be that many. I mean, I don't know. I will look it up and I will get back to you. Are you thinking maybe that they could go to like to actual like debate tournaments? And I would love that. That would be amazing. Um, yeah, I also would love, I've been dying to do this for years, honestly. So um, I'm really interested in this idea and I'm planning to do all the research and do whatever training I have to do to be their like coach or whatever. Um, that, was yes, actually, I know. that was actually something that Quincy did when he was in high school. He did the debate team. Oh, I love that. See, I, it totally makes sense, right? Where it's like, there's nothing kids love doing better than like stating their opinions very loudly about things. So debate seems like a natural fit. Um, but do they have Toastmasters in this country? They do. Uh -huh. they do. Okay, I was Toastmasters. Yeah. Were you really in high in high school? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, you find out so much of this stuff about people's lives. So. Um, yeah, so if there if there's an interest in um, in really pursuing the the speech and debate, I I'm all for it. Um, I'm gonna look up how how we actually make a team and do that. I think you just have to register with the with the National Speech and Debate Association, and then you can start going. So, yeah. Any other questions, comments? Sorry, that's the 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 cleaning staff coming in because you know I'm still a butler. <laughs> um, okay, well, you know where to find me. I'm always in the park house. You can reach me via email. Some of you I see in the classroom all the time. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions about anything, please let me know. Um, I am more than happy to answer your questions or. You know, if you if you have feedback for me as well, I'll definitely take it. This was just my 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 big brainstorm about how to put this whole program together. Um, I do want to give my pitch for the next one, which is the last one. Oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Um, Natasha, do you know the date for the next one? in May, like May 8th. I have too many tabs open. My computer is so sorry. hard. Let me look at my phone. <laughs> Hold on a second. I'm sorry, I put you on the spot. I didn't mean to. It's okay. I should, I, I, I saw it and I think it's like May 5th, but I, I don't want to give the wrong date. So um hold on a second you're right may 8 wow good may for me eight. okay yeah. Uh, yeah on may 8th you can join us for our final coffee and conversation series about the high school um it's arguably one of the coolest ones because i'm going to be talking about all of the experiential components to the program so like anything that doesn't fit in like some of these like boxes that we've been putting them in right like we did the the science we did uh, college admissions, we talked about Spanish, about math, and now um, humanities and language arts. 
I want to talk about all the other cool stuff that is involved in this program, right? So what kind of work study opportunities are they going to have that they get off campus? What kind of entrepreneurship opportunities are they going to have to really start and run a business? Um, what kind of trips are we going to go on and where are we going to go? Um, you know, what are, what are we really doing around, um, uh, mental health, right. And, and supporting, um, our young people in this way, as well as their physical health, right. What are we doing for PE? What are we doing for, um, the arts and other kinds of creative expression? So basically all of those other sort of special pieces, um, that make up, a a very robust program. That's what we're going to be talking about at the last one in our typical Butler flair. So, um, please join us again on May 8th. And yeah, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you. You're welcome.